a warm welcome to this event during the Future Week for Lund University. We are here at Skissenas Museum in Lund and we I welcome both the virtual audience that we have through the cameras to us and then also the audience here in the room. It's not a big audience but we have actually some real audience as well. I welcome you under the headline of Max for an ESS as Engines for Breakthrough Science. And this event is also hosted by LINX, and that is the Lund Institute of Advanced Neutrons and X-ray Science. The LINX is talking about setting the stage for the optimal use of Max4 and ESS, and they are talking about establishing, promoting, but also creating. And one of the, the fourth mission for LINX is actually attract, and they have attracted. The new director incoming, Trevor Forsyth, that is actually coming from ILL, that is the, the uh, Institute Lo Longva in Grenoble. So please, Trevor, welcome to this event. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's, uh, I'm the incoming director of Lynx, as you've just said, as of uh, the 1st of December. In the meantime, I'm actually in Grenoble, where I'm in charge of the Life Sciences Group at the ILL, the Institut Larry Langevin. And it's my pleasure on behalf of Lynx to, to uh, host this event, or with Lynx to host this event. And I know also that you are a very experienced user of both these techniques. Yes, I've started off in x-rays, in fact, um, initially at Darsby Laboratory in the UK, and then latterly um, at the ILL as an external user, and towards the end of 1999, I actually came to ILL on what I thought was going to be a short-term secondment. And <laughs> 21 years later, I've, I'm here, so, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And then on your side we have the Life Science Director at Max4, Marjolin Tunnesen. Warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you. And you are also, I know, a user. Yes, I was. Uh, I came first to then called MaxLab as a user. And mm. then as a beamline scientist and now as a director. And you also had the user office, I know, at, um, yes. at Max4. Um, Th that's correct. I had the user office in both the academic and the industrial sense of the world. And uh, both user groups are important for us. Very nice to have you here. And the last and not least guest at this, this panel is then the incoming Director General for ESS, Helmut Schuber. And I think you've been actually a former colleague to Trevor here, haven't you? Well, I kind of was his boss uh, up to end of last month. <laughs> and now you need to be collaborators. And now I have to be very collaborative, <laughs> yes. But a warm welcome. And you Thank have you. also a long, long experience. But even if we now have the life science here, you are a PhD in physics. Yes, yes. Um, more the hard side of the science that we do. So solid state physics uh, in particular. But as I was managing the ILL for the last five years and before that science director, one of the privileges of the job is that it's actually fascinating how broad mm. it, the subjects are that you come in contact with. So obviously, it's, it's, it's a privilege that in the morning you have some fundamental physicists that talk about dark matter, and then in the evening you're challenged by some structural biologists <laughs> like Trevor about some latest developments in his area. So. Oh, that's good. Warm welcome to you as well. Thank you. And we have an exciting fall to look forward to with, with you coming in on the 1st of November and Trevor on the 1st of December. So that's good. So we see what, what you will say in maybe six months' time about all this. To begin then the discussion on this during, under this headline, uh, is it then true that Max4 and ESS are good societal investments for the future? Have the countries all together being on the good side? Are they doing the right thing? Who would like to start? Marilyn. Maybe I, I can start. Yeah, yes, I think it is. And um, I, I think it's a very good in investment for science, uh, and science has many societal impacts. Um, but apart from that, if you look to the kind of science that we support, uh, and that was already uh, mentioned, it's very, very broad. But it's also very, very broad at the stages of, like, uh, development. 
So we support basic research, we support applied research, and sometimes even at the later stages where industry really need help with, for example, production. So at all those stages, we can actually support. Uh, and uh, I think the, the, both the broad and the kind of science that we support, from structural biology, archaeology, engineering, to fundamental physics, to really where we can contri contribute, mm. makes that we are a very good investment. Mm. And I haven't even spoken about other things. Mm. What do you say, Helmut, on well, the same topic? I, I, I can fully agree. In particular, I think we are dealing with two areas here where Europe is excelling. Right, I, I'm now nearly 60, so I, I have a little bit uh, 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 an experience of the past. And when I was long, young, everything was happening in the United States. And uh, as a young scientist, you had to go there to, to be in, uh, confronted with the latest developments and techniques. In our area, this has changed. People come here because that's where the show is going on. And so it's also very important that we keep up uh, the investment in these areas, that we train uh, the young students, that we attract the best subjects. And so I think what also one has to understand for maybe the broader audience, we, we are not doing science predominantly for ourselves. We are providing um, potent tools for what we call users. And so we have thousands of people, of scientists, from, as you have said, industry, academia, coming to our sites to perform their science there. And so I think we have a tremendous impact in, in these areas. And it's big investments, that's also true. So we have to, as an obligation and responsibility, to make the best out of it. And that's why we count on institutions like Links. Because if you have the best tools, you need also the best subjects. You know, you need the best people to use those tools. And that's why we have to bring these things together. And mm. uh, so I think Lund is a great place for, for, for doing this. Mm. But then, Trevor, coming from the inside and now sitting a bit on the outside, how do you look at this? Well, I think, I think the, 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 in, the investments are very serious in the impact that they will have both nationally and in terms of interactions um, internationally as well. I mean, Marjolein, Helmut, they've mentioned specific areas, mat materials, food, um, biology, um, and even things like cultural heritage that knock on um, into very tangible and, um, things for the, for the public. But there's also the point that um, they enhance research capabilities that that, um, that weren't accessible before. So if you think of big groups that have lots and lots of people um, available for their, for their research, uh, facilities such as this obviously make, are very good for people like that, for groups like that, but they're also very good for individuals who have, have a good idea and can just make a single proposal, and if it's a good proposal, it gets funded, and it gives them a way of progressing, a way of starting, and it gives them a foothold in a way that's, much, uh, that's quite hard, often, for newcomers in the field. So I think that's, that's important. Um, I think the international engagement aspect of that, that's a national thing, what I've just talking about, but I think the international context is very important as well because um, here, the new facilities, the, the developing facilities can learn from the outside and um, they can also contribute to the, uh, to, to the international community and that's a way of establishing um, a good relationship. And I think this brings in industry as well as the basic science and not to be forgotten, it brings in education um, because we need to think about, the few, we're all sort of you know, late career people or mid, mid late career people and we need to think a little bit about um, the future PIs and how the whole field is going to develop in that context. Mm -hmm. sure Thank thing. you. I would like also to invite the audience to Menti. We have menti.com for you to put questions or statements or comments on the discussion. We welcome questions from you. So if you go to menti.com, you have the code, I think you have the code right now behind us. It's 18553884. And should we change slides, so will this re this code will reappear in a few minutes, so it will, won't disappear totally. And we also asked also the audience in the room to use Menti, because we will not have sort of questions in the room to make this a bit better for everybody, same, same, same way for everybody. 
But when you say all this, and this is a good investment, uh, and you were mentioning actually, some of you, the international part of, of all this, how do we then link the global ecosystem to these infrastructures and to Europe and to, to the communities that we need to meet and collaborate with? How do we do that? Who would like to start? Yeah, I mean, the, the global aspect is very important because we are not a single entity isolated. And uh, in Europe um, and in, in the world, we have, have series of synchrotron facilities as well as neutron facilities. And um, between the facilities, we need to talk, we need to collaborate, we sometimes need to compete, um, but this is a very vibrant environment. And the same thing is with the user um, community. It, it's extremely important that we have our instruments developed in such a way that, that the users really can use them, that we also have a keen eye on where the science is going and, and keep all those aspects in, in view. So that requires quite a lot of networking and talking and going out to people and be open-minded and, and, and all those kind of things. Mm. Um, th that would be my first reaction. We, we also need collaboration programs, and Europe has been very good in that sense. We, we've had really good EU-sponsored collaboration programs that, that allow the, the facilities, the users, to come together to tackle specific um, issues and, and, and really uh, challenges that we have had. Mm -hmm. so, so in Europe, I think we can be quite grateful to, to the way that the EU has actually helped us uh, in these aspects. What do you bring from ILL in this aspect, as exper earlier experiences when it comes to the ecosystem and the collaboration? Well, I, I think the ILL is an example of how this uh, international collaboration works. And, but I'll go to the ESS because uh, I, the ESS, as you know, is, is by definition international, European. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of the sheer size of the investment already, we, uh, one country c normally cannot shoulder the, the burden. And also to fill the uh, e ESS once it will be up and running with uh, more than 20 instruments, hopefully we can go to 40, will require input from the scientific community uh, of the whole of Europe. Uh, so that, that's an enormous challenge. Mm. Uh, in, in our governance, we have uh, 13 partners. That's it, Karin, right? I have to, have to verify because I'm, <laughs> 13, I'm a little bit 13. new <laughs> in, the, in the job, um, which also have to contribute financially. So at the moment, for example, this is one of our biggest challenges, uh, make sure that uh, they all open their purse uh, accordingly. Uh, and, uh, and going further, I think we're also the ESS will be innovative. We, we, we harness the know-how from all over Europe, which what we call in-kind partners. So many of the components that are installed here at the ESS are produced all over Europe, whether it's the technical parts for the accelerator, for the target, whether it will be the instruments. And the idea is that this naturally then continues afterwards. So this has to be a European beehive, right, this, this uh, ESS. And in this sense, I think it's a little bit different from MOX4, which is a, a national um, facility, but in terms of science, we are international. Mm -hmm. And actually this is, uh, and I know it from the ILL, this is in our modern world, uh, a challenge for the business model, because by definition, we just collaborate among scientists and we don't make the others pay for what we offer but the funders, the ministries that put the money into our facilities, they would like to have an invest, investment on their, uh, a return on their investment in their country. So we have to find the right business models to allow international collaborations, because in some sense I always say if a Nobel Prize is done at MAX4 or ESS, we all profit from it, and mm. even if it's not Swed Swedish mm. scientists that do it, because it has been done here with those facilities. But uh, on the other hand, I fully understand that uh, Sweden or Denmark or any of the other countries, they look carefully what they get back for their education, for their industry, for their academic mm -hmm. system from those investments. Mm -hmm. 
So it's, it's intrinsically European and, 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 and with that has all the challenges and all the opportunities that come with that. Mm -hmm. Marilyn, you mentioned the, the broad use of these techniques. So we actually had an, a question from the audience here about how do we then open up these techniques to a broader community, research community, but also industry. I mean, because I think parts is quite a small family that knows what this, what this can do, what these kind of facilities can do. Yeah, so, so that is actually one of the biggest challenges we work with. And it comes at different levels. Um, there are some users that don't even know they can use us. Mm. Uh, so it starts there. And, and, and that is really outreach, going out to people, trying to come with use cases that show that other people had specific scientific problems where we could actually play a role. Mm. And then we have to target deeper and more detailed to go to the specific fields, because specific fields are, can have very specific requirements uh, and needs. What is also very important is the ecosystem surrounding us. We, we are not alone, and we need help in this, this respect. Um, Lynx is a prime example of a group where we can really, really get help with these questions, um, but there are other um, places as well, experienced users that could work as ambassadors for us, for example. So there is a whole kind of ecosystem surrounding us mm. that, that, that we need to interact with to, to address this. Uh, but Lynx is definitely a, a prime example. So Trevor, how will you solve this then? Uh, well, I, I think... You're the key, I, 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 I'm, I'm the key. Right. <laughs> I, I, I think the, um, one of the things that, uh, about one of Lynx's ma major functions is to we engage in, in we identify and engage in the development of particular themes, amongst other things, and, and they may include themes in in biology, materials, uh, food. There's a very good collaboration developing now from Northern Lights on food with Selma Marig and Tommy Nylander, <laughs> and I think they're doing a great job in trying to um, evangelise um, industry and and, um, and 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 research groupings. Uh, to, to turn them on to the capabilities that uh, they have access to and how they can impact their, their work. So I think there's, there's, there's a sort of an outreach function built into links and uh, in identifying particular areas that relate to specific challenges, whether they're global challenges or uh, you know, um, development, sustainability development challenges. And I think links has a very core function in, in developing that. And in linking between um, uh, the facilities here and the facilities in other places which are, have already been through with their growth and development phase to a certain extent, and where the technologies can be brought back and shared um, with them um, uh, internationally as well as throughout the country. Mm. Thank you. Also, for the audience, if you have some thoughts on what is missing, what is needed when it comes to this, how we build and how we use these facilities, so please use Menti and come in. Here we got an audience question right on. What lessons, both positive and negative, can we learn from other sites around the world when it comes to creating a dynamic and productive science hub? Helmut, you were talking about the hub. So yeah. what can we learn? Well. What, 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 we, what can we learn? I think, first of all, you have to learn that it's, um, uh, it, it, this ecosystem has to be maintained actively. It's not something that is going to happen by itself. It's, uh, it's an effort, and I always like to think about our facilities like companies, right? We have clients, um, and you have to take care of your clients. Uh, then you also have to see how your clients change. So what are the clients of tomorrow? And you have to prospect, you have to get in contact with them, you have to nurture these fields. And uh, basically we have, we, we have discussed about this uh, already before. Uh, we also have this whole breadth in the technology readiness levels, right? What we always say from zero to 10, where we were present everywhere. But the real challenge I found from, from my past experience over the last years is at the higher technology readiness levels, where you want to get in contact with industry or let's say industry related research, mm. uh, because that's a real uphill struggle. And I think we need in Europe better tools 
uh, as Trevor has said, one of the important things is that when, when a big group thinks about, well, we are pursuing this research topic, let's say we want to produce better batteries in Europe, right? Hopefully we still do that, and it's not only in China. So we want to do that, what do we need? That the synchrotrons and the neutrons are somewhere there, mm -hmm. present when they develop their programs, uh, because they can add value. If they are not, they will just not do it, and they miss just this competitive edge that we have in Europe, they may, may just miss out on that. So, so that is something we, we really have to work. That's, I think, a lesson. A lesson. It's something that, as a community, we have not yet solved. And nobody has solved it, I think, uh, uh, globally. N neither our American colleagues. There is lots of trials. Uh, but the most important lesson is take care, really take care of your community. Uh, because I think as uh, people learn in management courses, getting a new client is 10 times more expensive than keeping a, an existing one. And that for us, for example, for the ESS, it's also important in this sense to collaborate with the network. We don't yet have neutrons, and it will still take a couple of years here in Lund before we have neutrons. So we have to make sure that we collaborate with those other centers in, in, in Europe that produce neutrons at the moment to keep that community really alive. And five years, the research develops enormously, right? If you think we're in a dynamic environment, in five years down the line, we will not do the experiments we, we do today. So we have to make sure that all this uh, uh, stays alive so that when we switch on um, our neutron beams, mm. that we, we have the, the top impact science on our facility. Yeah, I know that you are also one of the founding fathers of this lens, the, the lead yes. for, for yes. the neutron sources in Europe. Um, so I, I imagine that you will keep on doing lens in the future. Well, we will certainly try to, even I think we have to go a step further, we have to get to real collaborations. Um, and as I said, ESS is in this sense um, really offering a lot of opportunities because due to its construction, it has this in-kind contributions, which sometimes are not so easy, right? Because you, mm. they also have a cost, but they make that we are linked closely to to lots of inst uh, uh, other institutions and, and know-how centers in Europe. And we would like to, I would like really to push that further. Mm. I know in Denmark they have a joint um, collaboration for a joint even association for the uses of both neutrons yeah. and x-rays. Um, Marilyn, would that be a way at least in Sweden to, uh, to follow maybe? Yeah, I think that Danskat is actually mm. quite a nice example of mm. a very good working model. Mm. Uh, now, the Danish uh, science community, uh, science, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, environment is organized in a different way. Mm. And in Sweden, it's, it's a little bit more complicated mm. uh, because of the, the way that, that the uh, government has put certain questions down to Wetenschapsrådet, uh, Vinova, mm. uh, and so on. In, mm. in Denmark, it's more centralized, and Danskat really works. Mm. Um, but uh, I would say that for the users of the facilities, they can make a real voice through, Dan, through Danskat. Mm. And I don't see that entirely in Sweden. So I think for our users, it could be actually a really good thing. Mm -hmm. But will that broaden the number of users, or may that even make it decreasing? Is, is it a good way of broadening the number of users to several other areas of, of science? Uh, it depends on the, the, the remit that mm. the, the, the entity would mm. get. Mm. Uh, but what I say for most of our users, um, most of our users see that science develops organically. Mm. And even when they're sticking to their prime uh, examples, there is much more uh, collaborative efforts made and very naturally uh, physicists start to work with biologists and um, all these kind of new linkages are made. Mm. So um, many of our users, I don't think they are so selfish that they want to keep everything for themselves. Uh, they, they are actually very generous in that sense. Mm. And, and I think anyway, uh, in science, you know, yeah. you choose the best technique. So the moment you become defensive, you're on the losing streak. Yeah. 
right? You preserve maybe for a couple more years some position, but that's not looking towards the future. And I think by teaming up, I don't know whether our audience knows why, why we are so close together. <laughs> the thing is, the X-rays and the neutrons, in many areas, we're, uh, our, uh, we have the same users, uh, we have topics that are addressed with both techniques and so on. So by teaming up, I think the community can only be stronger, I'll make, as uh, Marlene has said, uh, the voice heard, and, uh, and it's only profitable because the moment you see that the other technique is better suited for what you're doing, you should use the other technique. Yeah. We, we are both expensive sources, and so we really should only do those experiments where we have a real high added value, mm. right? And this is best done by friendly competition and by the, the scientist does it uh, by nature because to be competitive, to be, be, be faster, uh, uh, than their colleagues, well, they will use, if available, if they are aware of the techniques that are best suited for their research. And so we just look, should look, let that go and not be afraid of that uh, and, and coordinate. I, I was at the Dunscott meeting just uh, two mm -hmm. weeks ago. Um, it's impressive, extremely lively, extremely young, so mm -hmm. uh, because there's also this aspect of uh, having lots of young students that go into the field. Uh, and, and it's really fostering, I think, uh, the community and will make sure that, that Denmark gets most out of their investment that they put into these facilities. So, so it's, it's, it's something I can only recommend. So sometimes you just have to copy what others do very well, right? So mm -hmm. don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. There, there we got some, some good advice. Um, I would also like to uh, remind the audience that you are very welcome to put questions via Menti or comments or statements that you would like to give us uh, during this discussion. So you are formally welcome to do that. Uh, Sweden then, because we are in Sweden, and Max4 is, uh, at least on the paper, a national Im infrastructure, even if you are an international infrastructure in, in the world. Well, um, well I, I would say that we are a national facility, but with, with a very big international aspect. Yeah, and ESS is an international, both or as an organization and, and also same as you in the community and, and uh, in the use. But, but we are in Sweden physically. Have Sweden a special responsibility? Is there some role or something that they should do that no one else can do? Talking about these aspects of, of getting out the value, having sort of a broad user community, reaching out. I, I think here the question is really, I mean, we are a national facility. So the question is really, for me, it's like, this is a known question. Okay. Because Sweden is I mean, we are the Swedish National Laboratory, and thereby there is an obligation, or, or at least from my point of view, uh, a very big interest of Sweden to really get this right. Uh, the, the question is probably a little bit more complicated for the ESS, I would say. <laughs> yes. uh, so, <laughs> for, for me, it's a kind of non-question, of course. But from the community side, and Trevor, that, does Sweden need to do something extra when it comes to, to actually getting out the, creating this science hub and the, uh, yeah, I using I the community, being a, international. Yeah, I, think I think the international context is extremely important. I mean, I, I totally agree with Marjolin about the remit in relationship to the stakeholders and, the, and, and so on, but the international context is extremely important given the, well, the, last, the last question as well, uh, the fact that all of the lessons, a lot of lessons that have been worked about joint X and facility operators working together have, been learnt. Some of them, at least, have been learnt. Some of the negatives and the positives, the things that haven't worked, the things that have worked, how you get people working together rather than working in separate silos, which actually used to be the case to a large extent on the Grenoble site. Um, people not working together even though they had capabilities to interact. And it was only with the development of key infrastructures, um, and in the case of my area, it was the partnership of structural biology, pushing people together from four institutes, mixing them all up, uh, initially some sort of difficulties and shoulder pushing and so on, but then it growing out of the younger people who don't have any investment in previous history and, and so on, and, and 
and organically growing through the system. So I think here it seems to me that obviously there's a remit for um, Max4 for the nation, but it's important that it really works across the nation and that it is pan-national, genuinely pan-national. Um, and um, for, for ESS, it's obviously international, but the context has got to be international throughout because the, the, the other operators are, will be doing different things, developing different things, and it has to work together. Mm. We got actually... Oh, sorry, Elman, you would like to uh, add something there? I think there. I have to respond to that because this is a question basically for, for me. For me, it's not a non-question, it's a real question. It's a real question, right? yeah. And, and the first thing I would think I would state is that Sweden has responsibility and is fully living up to that responsibility. I mean, if you just look at the investment, uh, maybe for the audience, how is the ESS uh, structured? We have two host countries, Sweden and Denmark. Uh, with, however, a big part of the investment uh, done by Sweden. There's also a reason for that, because we all know that facilities like that have a high economic return. Right? This is mainly Swedish companies that work uh, on the site so far, at least, for the civil constructions and so. And hopefully for 40 more years, uh, all the salaries paid will be spent in Skåne region, um, and sometimes maybe in Copenhagen. Uh, so, so that, that is this aspect. Uh, and then as a host country, you also are the one who has to make sure that the whole governance, that is all the re relation with the, with the other countries in Europe, is orchestrated, right? That you get the funding. Uh, so that also is, 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 is a huge responsibility. Then I would say there is also a huge responsibility on Europe to make sure that Sweden, ha having taken on that uh, important task, that you don't let them alone in that task. And so we have to make sure that there is really, the whole of Europe considers this facility here in Lund, their facility, they support it uh, accordingly, with uh, financially, scientifically, technologically, and so on. So, so that's why, for me, uh, an institution like the ILL, and now like the ESS, this is building Europe. This is showing the world that Europe, which is not a, a, a block like the US, right? Because in the United States, the Department of Energy would launch something like the ESS, and you would have one uh, agency to talk to, and nobody would say, what is the responsibility of Tennessee? in sustaining SNS. Mm. Europe is different. We want to stay different. We know that it's uh, an, an extreme wealth that we have these different cultures. Um, and what then we have to show the rest of the world that we can stay competitive by also getting our act together and where necessary collaborate. Mm. And so that's for me the the, uh, my, my dream is really that, that uh, let's say, over the next years, everybody will say, we have in Europe this outstanding facility in Lund, next to this national outstanding facility. Uh, we're all proud of it, and we all commit to it, and uh, so, so, so a European dream, right? With a strong responsibility for Sweden and Denmark. Mm -hmm. That was a statement that we will remember. Mm. Uh, really good. Thank you. We have a question from the audience that is sort of in, in part of this. Um, we, the big science projects, well, we haven't used the, the word big science today, but that's sometimes what we call the result of these big infrastructures or facilities. They often promise to deliver, and that actually was also my own question, <laughs> own next question. We talk about this in the headline, the breakthrough science. Uh, and many do in the end deliver stellar results, but they take time and great patience is needed. How do we manage expectations? And we also had an earlier question on the same theme, actually. How do we, how do we get also the other people around, outside the community to understand this and manage sort of all these expectations and the long time that it sometimes takes? What do you say about that? Yeah, Would this, Maryland land like to start? Yes. Yeah, th this, is, this is really one of the, of the challenges because uh, building a facility, um, uh, even building an instrument in itself, uh, can be the greater part of a decade. Mm. And um, in that time, science is also changing, so you, you're running 
uh, with a target that moves itself. Um, so th this is really, uh, it comes down to communication. In, in this sense, communication is, of course, incredibly important. Mm. Uh, we have to be transparent in how we work, um, that things will not happen overnight, because, uh, like I said, it can take many years. Uh, and we have to be very, very clear when we come with the results, what they are and what they mean. So it's a lot of communication, I would say. Mm and transparency on the processes, mm. so that people also understand, yeah, it takes three or four years to complete it, and then we, we need to, to test, and then the results will come. But uh, it, it requires patience. And then you have the next, the next phase, yes. because the results doesn't come the same day, of course, no. to the final, yes. uh, final results. So, yeah. Yeah. What do you say, Helma? Well, I I trust would challenge a little bit the word big science because I think we have to be careful there is big science and there is big facilities that do lots of small science, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I think our facilities are more, as I have said, we have thousands, at the ILL to give you an idea, we have about a thousand experiments per year in a normal year. So 1,000 different topics are investigated. Uh, we, we are living in something which I call the big bang of knowledge development, mm. right? I mean, it's incredible how our knowledge develops and this creates outstanding uh, conditions of living. We have to admit it. We, when we open the newspaper, we read about the climate is changing and, um, and that's all bad. But in the end, if you look what ha we have achieved for the, for the population on this planet over the last uh, decades, uh, in terms of expectations of living, healthcare, uh, access to uh, knowledge. Uh, that's outstanding. You can live in the center of Africa with your iPhone, you get any protein structure you like with one click, right? Now, where is this all? Science is empowering. And it's empowering us to do the right thing or the wrong thing. But this is then our human responsibility. Uh, so these big science facilities, if you look, uh, they have contributed enormously to this knowledge explosion. Mm. It's just take, it's not my domain, it's their domain, mm. structural biology, right? I mean, where do all those structures come from that you can download from the internet? They come from the synchrotrons, right? Over the last years, they now come from electron microscopes, and we have now learned that maybe we can bridge them with the computer, which will challenge their business model, and they have to adapt to it. Mm. That's why everything is moving so fast. So that's what we contribute to science, right? The technology that creates the digital revolution. Um, the semiconductors that are in there, all that was developed over the years. For me, it's like building a cathedral. Thousands of stones, right? Which is the most important one? The final one that closes the vault is the most visible, and if you take it out, everything breaks down. But without the foundation, without all these little experiments, the thousands of thesis students that have worked hard, cathedral wouldn't stand neither. So we are developing to that, our responsibility is, as it has been said, that everything we do is excellent. We have to, to, to have this drive towards excellence. And, and, and that we do by looking at each other, at colleagues, and making sure that we're always performing in the best possible way. So, big science, yes and no. Uh, and then it, it is about communications because we are not the ones that will discover a black hole in the center of the galaxy and say, that's it. That was our objective for 20 years. Now we have discovered it. We have all these small contributions in so many different areas. Um, and so we have to make also the society aware how it helps them, for example, solve now the problems that the technology of the past has created. Right, because that's basically what we are here. And that's why I also think we have to be always in, in, in a dynamic system. Everything is urgent because we want to have the best batteries tomorrow to keep Europe competitive. And I hope that we can contribute to these things like, like to the other questions. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, that, that would be my, my answer to that, to that question. Mm -hmm.
What do you say then, Trevor, um, your, your no, I, role I, in this? I, I, to I totally agree that the, 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 the large facilities doesn't necessarily mean big science in the way that the, trust, the question was posed, because mm. there's lots and lots of individuals, as I was saying earlier, who can, who can engage with um, these facilities with the thousands of topics that are covered. But in the end, um, if you look, at, you, you read the textbooks now, or the textbooks that are used to teach um, undergraduates and, and school children now, they are based on the results that have occurred over the last two decades, yep. um, and that's the way things develop. So there has to be some sort of management of expectation, even though people are putting in huge amounts of money for these big facilities, there has to be some sort of management, and I think that actually is outreach and education and bringing, in places like this where there's massive infrastructures for well, university around here and in the rest of the country, is, is, is bringing that to, to, the, to the doorsteps of the people who are learning it, who, the, the, who are going to grow into the scientific science of the future. Uh, and, and maybe to add to that yeah. is what is really important for our facility is continuous adaptation, right? We are built, as has been said, over decades, mm. but we also exist afterwards for decades. Yes. Um, but during that time, we are not standing still. If you look at a synchrotron today and a synchrotron, 20 years ago, uh, it's completely changed, right? And Max 4 is one of those who developed and pushed uh, the technology uh, with uh, this uh, fourth generation kind of techniques. Well. So, so we, we are standing, we are always adapting in, in, in these areas and, and that's yeah. very important for, uh, for us in, in, yeah. in, in the business uh, model. I mean, for, from my field, I'm a structural biologist, just like Tafa, and as you already pointed out, electron microscopy has made enormous step forwards. If you really look at the why, one big thing was the detector development, yes. which actually relates back to us, because quite a lot of the detector development comes from synchrotrons and neutrons. So all these things are interlinked, and sometimes the uh, step forwards come also from the technology developments that we are making uh, for our experiments and where we really interact with our user community and saying, okay, we would like to support this kind of science, but we would need these kind of instruments and therefore we do development of detectors, of yep. instruments and of other things. Uh, and in all of that, as Trevor points out all the time, the main ingredient is actually people. Yes. Without people, you won't do it. And so I, all, all of this comes together and it's... And I think what we really have realized maybe as, as a main change is that, you know, when Neutron started in the 70s, it was a lot about what I would say solving fundamental questions related to materials. Because why do we say we are societally relevant? It's because we all work on processes and materials and processes and materials are the basis for industry. Uh, so we worked Let's take the example, we wanted to understand thermal conductivity in general. How is heat transported in something like this table? Today, that's not the question anymore. Those questions have been answered. Today, it's very concrete. If I have a thermoelectric device, a device that transforms heat into electricity, how can I optimize this uh, with all the details of the industrial process, the imperfections of a real material, and not one grown by a student for a particular experiment. So this was this adaptation process that we have gone through, and it was absolutely essential, because if we had just stayed with the old topics, we would be out of business, right? And I see it now, the real challenge for us is to anticipate what is going to be in 10 years those questions that are really relevant and that we have to answer. And to have the experiments ready with the detectors and the yeah. flocks and all that, so that these communities can say, well, MOX4, that's the thing I want to go to to get the answer to my question. Is that part of your assignment, yes, well, in I, a way, I, I from guess Link's so. I mean, if you think, if you think perspective? About, if you think about, yes, very much so. I mean, if you think about it, we all can look at science and we can say certain areas where communication with uh, so politicians and with education and all the rest of it has done, been done badly or where it's been done well. If you look at CERN, they've done an amazing job uh, for e evangelizing science at, the, at a huge, big facility. And if you look at structural biology, I think they have done it very well. It comes it perhaps a little bit easier in a certain way to, 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 to describe it. And some areas are more difficult than others. But I think that is a central aspect, concern for this whole thing about managing the expectations and communicating with uh, 
with the, the stakeholders in the end, the people who pay for it all, and um, and and what what they are getting out of it, whether it's tomorrow or two decades later. Mm. We have a question here from the audience. If you can give some good examples what, that really shows the benefits of these large, expensive facilities to the wider society, do you have any good examples in mind? Well, uh, if I can fall back on structural biology, um, I think here um, we, we need to realize that proteins are, are the workhorses in our bodies and most medicines react with, with them. Uh, for the development of modern medicines, synchrotrons have been really important. And, and at the moment, pharmaceutical industry uh, is one of our biggest industrial uh, partners uh, because of the need for structural information for drug de de uh, discovery. So, so, and that goes on all different levels. Uh, even if we look to coronavirus, uh, which is of course highly topical, the amount of knowledge that we have gathered the last year mm. and where synchrotrons and neutrons have played a uh, really important role is really, really big. And we wouldn't have a new medicine that is an antiviral on the market right now or if, if there wasn't uh, synchrotron radiation available to do such So that's studies. maybe the most, the most immediate, you could say, example no. is the yeah. And during yeah. this, with the COVID-19. Yeah. But, but history also tells you, I mean, even before synchrotrons, the impact of X-ray diffraction, mm. DNA, the, deal, the double helical yeah. structure of DNA, the, the ribosome in, 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 in yeah. not so long ago, the structure of the ribosome, viral structures, spherical virus structures from crystallography, all of them are landmark things that you can pick out uh, as part of a long journey um, in which a whole load of de technical developments and mutually interacting support systems have come together to, to, to allow the thing to happen. And I think uh, for the neutrons, if I, I am talking about sort of the biological area at the moment, Helmut will be able to give other examples, but for the neutrons, it's actually, in a, a paradoxically, it's a younger science because mm -hmm. even though people have known about it for a long time, the technology hasn't really caught up. With it. I think technology with X-rays has been very, very different and much more easy to develop. But the neutrons, it's taken quite a lot longer for very reasonable mm -hmm. technical um, uh, reasons uh, to develop. And it's only now that you see these instruments popping up all over the world and, and producing stuff. Um, it's still challenging, it's still very difficult, but the results are starting to justify the investment that you need to put into them to get to work, whether it's the diffractometers that are being built so with innovative ideas behind them, or whether it's the sample provision that you have to tailor to, to, to the problem. So I think there's, there's, there's a huge amount that has happened and a huge amount that will happen. I've heard the um, comment that this, the mobile phone wouldn't look like it does if it weren't for neutrons. Is that true? Uh, I am not sure part, about that one. I would have to defer <laughs> well, to somebody else's I think, opinion. I think what we what we can add, well, with neutrons, our, our main client is magnetism. Mm. Yeah. People that mm. study magnetism. And so storage devices, uh, giant magnetic resistance, all these things, uh, that was uh, uh, studied uh, with, uh, with neutrons uh, in details, uh, as I said, uh, before semiconducting materials. So in the hard condensed matter, uh, all these fundamental developments that mm. you find now uh, in, in, in your phones, uh, that, that was neutron uh, mm. developments. Mm. So uh, it was almost in. true then. Yes. <laughs> almost true. Well, it, it, maybe it would, would be square and not rectangular <laughs> without, but um, I don't know whether it would look the same. But, but I think the, what, the one thing I would like to add here is, uh, because this is important in the context of what we have lived through the last two years, because when the crisis hits, everybody says, well, now we need the scientists to help us solve that, right? Mm. And we are naturally ready to do that, but provided we, we are prepared for that. It's not like uh, you have the coronavirus and then you say, well, now I create the collaborations that will investigate those spike proteins. It's because you have done this work before, because the collaborations exist that really, I mean, it's breathtaking. Um, I, I think it took six months from the publication of the genome to the first uh, inhibitors being proposed via synchrotron experiments uh, 
uh, for blocking the coronavirus. But this was only possible because these university groups had already collaborated with the people at the synchrotron facilities um, before. And it's the same, uh, we, in, in Corona, our colleagues from SNS, they now have, uh, I think there's even a patent pending with a pharmaceutical company for a new medication. This is the same. Mm. And I think where we will have a real change in the next years is the impact of digitalization. If, I don't know whether this is the right word to use here, but uh, we, we, we were making enormous progress in modeling our world, right? And, and, and for example, in predicting new protein structures. Uh, uh, but this is on all fronts, this is in all materials, and we have to see how we, as the experimental facilities, adapt our business model to link onto that development, because I think in the future this will go hand, it has to go hand in hand, right? The, the people that do the modeling, they will have specific questions, they'll say, I have a doubt, is my model really re right here? And then we have to be capable and say, well, we put that into the beam, we will tell you whether you are right. And if they don't write, they can adapt their models and they can make better predictions. Uh, they, they run through billions of structures to in the end maybe identify one candidate for a new medication. And sometimes it will hinge on this one experiment with neutrons or, or x-rays, uh, whether this is a good prediction or not. So again, and our new generation of scientists has to adapt to this new world, which is a real challenge. So, yeah, I mean, like the lands. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, carry on. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment one other thing. Um, the amount of data that we are producing is also uh, very enormous. And the way that we have been using data in the past, where everybody was sitting on their own, while going to a much more open access model mm. and, a, and, a, and a way of collaborating even on the data itself uh, will be another aspect that will become very important in the future. And once again, I think that Europe is taking a lead here uh, to the FAIR principles, to working with this on a European level. Um, I, I think there can be a much bigger benefit coming, much quicker because of the way that we can share things at the end. Mm. Well, well, so still the, the data question is... You're, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, again, yeah. I'm not a specialist, but the EMBL database, yeah. right, was, was the database for yeah. coronavirus, mm. and it was the database because it had an open mm. uh, structure yeah. with, with, with confidential sharing, uh, with, with sharing in confidence. So. Trevor, you wanted to no, I was comment just, as well. I was really, it's just following up Helmut's point about the, the fact that the landscape is changing so quickly that into everything that we think about, we've got to sort of keep a, a strong eye on the versatility and, and, and the responsiveness that, that, uh, that these capabilities offer. And that comes to, so I mean, we've mentioned for the biology, it's the artificial intelligence, the pro secondary protein structure mm -hmm. prediction, how much that's impacting certainly the X-ray world um, and the electron microscopy as well. It's the way it's coming in and, and, and it's changing the scene. And that's happening quickly. It's, it's not the, the, you know, things that haven't, for electron microscopy and for the, for the AI developments, those have happened really, really quickly compared to the previous major developments that have occurred on, on the scene. And that's something that we have to be able, to, that type of thing we've got to be able to respond to. And that in turn means that we have to provide infrastructure surrounding and between the facilities that allow, that allow us to react to these things and, and, to, and to adjust both the capabilities and, and the provision, the infrastructure surrounding um, mm. the big structures. And that comes to things like Science for Scandinavia, what, what we develop there yeah. and, and what, how, we, how we manage um, development. But do you have the resources, do you have the competence and do you have the time to, I mean, to also include this in the work? Well, that's where we need, I think, for example, uh, I, I don't know Lund University sufficiently well, right, whether they, what their standing is in artificial intelligence and these things. But if, if we have to do that at ESS with, I don't know, 600, 700 people, that's impossible. That's not our core business also. No. We have to do it as a broad academic community. I wouldn't even say we have to do it as neutrons or x-rays, right? No. Uh, there is now in Europe, uh, most countries, big agendas launched by the various research ministries on digitalization. Quite a bit of money on the table, 
but as you have said, it's not money, it's people in the end. That counts, so we have to, we have to see that we get the right people. We don't, want to, we don't want to become experts in artificial intelligence, right? We, that's not our toss, but the algorithms that are developed by others and so, we have to make sure that we, that we can use those in the most profitable way for, for our business. Mm. So it's a real challenge and we can only solve it together. Yeah. I got a question here from the audience that I, might, I think is important for us to actually, for you to answer. And it comes in, in the connection to cell biology. Can we study living objects at least for a limited time? And I know, Marjolin, this is one of your favorites. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it's actually quite funny because this morning I was in a workshop on, on imaging, uh, a method called tomography. And there, there are beautiful examples of living organisms that lived maybe for three, four seconds but we still were able to, to actually make uh, small movies of a fly flying or of a heart beating, uh, as I saw this morning. So yes, it is possible. For a limited time then? Uh, for a limited time. Mm. But, but I think for the ESS it's maybe different. Well, for us, in some sense, it's easier because our damage to living <laughs> matter is at least in the short, it's not in the second range, right? We don't, we don't kill stuff within seconds. Uh, so I'm just not aware of uh, scientific questions that would have been brought to neutron facilities, but Trevor, you may, may, no, may I, know I, I more on, on really living organisms. Right? I, think, I think one thing to, to just to reflect on, sometimes it's good to reflect on, 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 on the ancient past, one thing that's driven synchrotrons right from the beginning is, a, is, is there was a fundamental drive towards increasing the flux of x-rays in order to study muscle and muscle contraction cycles. Mm. And that just drove, that drove it. It went, led to rotating anode x-ray sources. It then led to the first, um, Synchrotrons outside parasitic exploitation for, um, for 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 physics, and um, and it's just things like that, you know, uh, whether it's collagen structure um, that that was being stretched to try and work out how it's structure related to function, muscle fibers and so on, um, and yes, of course, uh, radiation damage in whole cells and so on. The, the fact that sometimes proteins crystallize inside cells and in, in functionally crystallize inside cells, and you can look at those those structures actually within cells that are alive. Yes, of course they die. X-rays are ionizing and, and they are aggressive to cells. Neutrons less so unless they contain something, some nasty absorbers or something. Um, but uh, in principle, you can do things with imaging. Um, I mean, we've all seen these pictures of uh, neutrons imaging water going up through plants and, and transpiration so of water yeah. through the roots into the leaves and things like that. So there's certainly opportunities there. It needs clever sample provision, clever experiments, um, but the opportunities for in vivo imaging exist for sure. Oh, that's good. That's a clear answer to the question. Helmut, I have to ask you, I mean, as we all know in Lund, uh, ESS is not really up and operating as uh, Max 4 is. And you were talking about the sense of urgency that everything is happening now. Um, or will ESS be sort of, will we be there in time for all this that is happening? Yes, yes, uh, I, 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 absolutely. Because we built in this adaptability, right? We don't build uh, the ESS for a science uh, case that we have today. Um, so uh, the time frame at the moment is that we will have uh, the start of our user program within the next five years. Uh, that has been mentioned before, we, the facilities we are building, the, that takes longer and longer because the facilities become more complex because we also want to reach higher performance. We also have to admit, uh, and I have not fully the experience for the ESS, but I know it from my previous job, compliance and what nowadays society requires, you know, in terms of regulations. Mm. Uh, it puts a simple uh, lower limit on how fast you can go. I always use the example, the ILL has been decided upon in 65, there was a conference in Geneva. In 67, they signed the uh, contract between the countries, which was already extremely rapid for a political process. And 71, we had neutrons to do experiments, four years. 
Um, okay, ESS 2014 uh, launching it, but before there was a long political process. I think well, there we have to be clear in Europe, we, we have, in my opinion, we must become more efficient in the decision making and the, uh, also I understand that our society wants that we stick to regulations strictly and all that, but we, we have to find the right level of paperwork, you put it clearly, so that these projects can be executed in a timely manner. And then we should again think like companies, delay is costly. So if you, because you say, okay, this year I cannot find the full funding, um, so let's go a little bit slower, uh, this is not a good option you know, of, of investing taxpayers' uh, money, right? You should go as, once you have decided to go, you go as fast, and then you build into your institute. That, that was the success model of the ILL. This ILL is actually quite surprising. It stayed for over 50 years and still is the world leading facility. And that was possible because everything at the ILL can be exchanged. Everything, including the reactor. The ILL is running w with the reactor source. Um, and you profit continuously from the technology upgrades. Uh, but it should not take too long because at some point, as you know, particularly if you buy, for example, computers, they may be obsolete by the time you, you switch them on. So, mm. so there is a challenge there. And we, we try to do our best to, with the new rebaselining that we are currently working out um, to stick to this timeline uh, so that we, that we can contribute at the earliest possible date. And as you were agreed on before in the panel, that we are building for the future, what we do today is maybe what we can use in both collaboration and technique in maybe 10 or 20 years. We don't know. We don't even know what we're building for. Well, the investment for the ESS is such that if you look at the contractual basis, uh, it runs up to 20, 60 something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, at least 40 years of exploitation, mm -hmm. uh, which is also necessary because it's a huge investment. Mm -hmm. So we really built for long term. Mm. It's not a short term uh, investment. Mm. And Max4 has a Max long history. Same. Right, yeah. exactly. And you also have a very long history proving that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we have another then issue. We've been into biology, we've been into a lot of different areas. Uh, we have a question from the audience really, climate crisis. What mm. can the X rays and neutrons do for the climate crisis? Do you have any ideas, any examples? Uh, I do, actually, um, and I have two different ones. Um, the first one, uh, climate is, of course, a very big thing, and it's very complex. And the way that clouds are actually part of the whole equation is a thing that we can study at, at synchrotrons. So clouds are forms of aerosols. They quite often need nucleating particles, and the way that clouds are formed uh, and play a role in climate research has been studied at synchrotrons, including uh, Max 4. So, so that is um, really looking into the system itself. The, the other thing is, of course, technology. Um, if we think of alternative ways of, of getting energy, uh, solar cells and the way that solar cells work, and the very intricate chemistry and knowledge of biology, that goes into new generations of solar cells, um, there is a lot of input from the big facilities. And it's something that, that we really, really are working on. Um, in itself, um, the efficiency of current solar cells compared with just a couple of years ago, it, it's really a new generation. And once again, uh, a big factor in that was knowledge that came from, from the facilities. From the facilities. Well, same for us, right? I mean, mm. the, the, first of all, yes, also directly on climate, like, uh, for example, climate and, and health. How would, uh, when you have smoke in a city in winter and it's humid, which is never the case here in Lund, I realized, um, how does it affect, for example, the tissue, the lung tissue mm -hmm. of newborn babies? So there is experiments like that. But then how do you fight the climate crisis? So uh, I talked already about batteries. Why? Because lithium is a very light 
uh, element, um, not ideal for x-rays, so we do lots of studies on, 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 on batteries, modern batteries. Uh, fuel cells, all the hydrogen cycle. Uh, hydrogen is extremely visible for neutrons. So, um, how how do those things work? Where is what is the water? You know, you produce water in a fuel cell. Is it blocking the fuel cell? Is it getting out? How is the hydrogen, the oxygen, mm. uh, diffusing there? How you can uh, optimize those uh, processes? And and then quite other things like uh, you know along. I think it is uh, the no, uh, not so far from here, but everything in Scandinavia, when I say not far, it's about 1,000 kilometers. On the, on the Norwegian coast, there's a lot of methane deposits, and we studied a lot the thermodynamic stability of, of those class rates, methane class rates, because if they would at one point uh, disintegrate and release all that methane into the atmosphere, that would be a real disaster in mm. terms of uh, uh, bringing the global temperatures even further up. And I could just go on on, 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 on topics like that, the ice formation in, in, the, in the atmosphere, um, how it interacts with dust particles and, and how the chemistry uh, uh, then for the ozone problem. So uh, that, that, that it never as I said, ends. it, it never seems. ends. No. Uh, I would say a lot of those 1,000 experiments a year we do naturally. Uh, nowadays are uh, concentrated on this because I think one thing we haven't mentioned is we are this is auto regulating with large scale facilities mm -hmm. because our users they come from the universities mm -hmm. and the universities fight for funding and the funding priorities are set by the governments so if we are not capable of delivering um, the right tools to the researchers at the university that today to a large extent work on those societally relevant topics, we are out of business. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something I find uh, is, is part of our success story, that we are forced to adapt to the, what the society considers at the moment as important through the funding channels. And, 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 so it's and a very clear value chain, you it's could a say, very where clear we value are one chain part, and, the facilities and, are one part. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. But I got a question yesterday from Christina Edström, the queen of batteries in Sweden at least, and I think also in Europe actually. <laughs> uh, and this might be a question to Trevor in a way. Should you like to see joint calls from Max4 and ESS, especially to decrease the interface to, in to industry and applied science? Um, I, I think would, you, would you drive something like that? Well, actually, I have driven something like that for in, in Grenoble in terms of joined up applications for small angle scattering with, with biological systems, and it makes an awful lot of sense to do that type of ac activity. I mean, we have a in Grenoble, there's a proposal system whereby you apply for one and you ask for another at the same time for the same sort of review process, and that works extremely well. It, in some areas, it's less obvious that you, you, you can do it, but certainly in the case of, of small angle neutron scattering and X-ray scattering together, it makes an awful lot of sense, and I suspect it would work. And, and in fact, for imaging um, in, in the ILL, there's also a joint effort for X and N um, exploitation, and uh, I think it makes a, a, an enormous amount of sense to do that. Mm. What mean, do it, the facilities? It's a no-brainer. What's your view on this? Um, it's hard for ESS, we are not really no, no, not in, in operation yet, but re principally. <laughs> I, I think in principle, no, we should uh, support this. Um, there might be time scale issues, there might be sometimes mm. uh, small issues how to schedule things, um, and there might be some security issues or safety issues. Uh, but all of these can op be overcome. Mm. And uh, th the main thing is to really work uh, had ahead of things. So um, we, we have been thinking about common, common user access modes, uh, partially to develop a, a user office that, that, that could handle these things. But due to the fact that we are in operations mm. and we have needs that we have now, mm. uh, we're a little bit out of sync. Mm. So when the ESS comes closer to the time to have users. Um, but ahead of when it really happens, we need to take these conversations up again and really, really discuss them.
Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very important to get that going early because my experience of trying to do it in Grenoble is, is that the uh, sort of administrative barriers that you might not expect to be a problem for all sorts mm. of reasons, that some of which were good and some of which were less good, um, were quite formidable. And it took a lot of stubbornness and persistence to get it through to a stage where it was functional. And um, so I think if you have that discussion, it should start soon, yeah. because it's, it, it is difficult. And safety comes into it as well, and different yeah. sort of issues. And so, um, but I think it's, a, it's, a really, it's, it's an obvious synergy that should be and pushed. It, and it's something that is strongly pushed by the European Commission, right? Yeah, and so exactly. you have mentioned Lens, but we mm. have Leaps. Mm. Mm. And now we have Arie, yeah. which is basically um, a club of synchrotron organizations, neutrons, uh, electron microscopes, and so on. Uh, my take on this is let's do it when there is added value. Mm. But there is a point where it becomes too complex and the return on investment is, is not there anymore. So I think we have to be highly intelligent in doing that. Uh, targeting those areas where, where it's really necessary um, and, and where it produces an additional scientific mm -hmm. return, but not do it as it is currently a little bit pushed on the European level for the sake of doing it, mm -hmm. right? Because, because at some point, um, to be very clear, when you get 10 million funding from the European Commission and you have 180 partners, <laughs> then basically you are financing your administration <laughs> and not science anymore. And so this is where I would say stop, then I prefer that my people do science and not filling out papers. Mm. Maybe so. that should not be for the European Commission <laughs> on the... <laughs> we can always have a discussion with the European Commission about that. Uh, and I think you have a lot of agreements around the country right now from the audience, I imagine. Uh, everyone that has been administrating a project or something or a program in EU, I think, agree to a certain extent. Even if they are important, they are an important partner, of course. Just now, my final question, and you have one minute each. Where, and this is from the audience, they helped me to actually create a better final question than I had prepared. Uh, what will the Nobel Prize be coming from the facilities in 10 years' time? Trevor, you start. My goodness, well, you, that's a crystal, what, what crystal, sort of, crystal what? ball question. I, I mean, there, there'll be areas where... <laughs> what areas? Uh, there's areas, what areas? I, there, I, I don't know, I, I, in, in, in my own... I, I perhaps would be a little bit too introspective about this and to think about my own areas where I work on... I work interested in, in neurodegenerative... Short answer. Uh, sorry, neurodegenerative <laughs> systems, um, um, issues such as associated with the aging population, Alzheimer's, amyloidosis, that I would like to see something That's the there. area. Yeah. That's what you yeah. would like to see. Marilyn, yeah. what area? Yeah, uh, a very, very difficult question. And maybe not the right one either. Uh, it's much more about the whole kind of uh, contributions that we can give. And it's not always about that one price. No, it's much bigger than that. Mm. And I, I, I think it's sometimes wrong to focus on the single Nobel Prize that is, uh, let's say it, chance as well. So uh, rather than that, I would say that we have a great outlook in, in life science, in engineering, in many of the challenges that we have in front of us, whether it's climate, whether it's health, whether it's a healthy planet as a whole, um, education, all these kind of things, and we can play a bigger role. And I, I think my answer goes there. Okay. Have you an area, Helmut? Qu quantum science, hopefully with an application in quantum computing, and if I really can dream, solving high TC superconductivity. Hmm. Great, thank you very much. And thank you the panel, Helmut, Marilyn, Trevor. Thank you the audience. Thank you also back home at your screens. Thank you the audience here in the hall. Thank you to the technicians. Thank you very much for this seminar, and I hope you found it fruitful. Thank you. Thank you. Tina.